Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Today I'm going to be teaching you out of a channeled document that was written or dictated really, I don't know, several years ago. We're, we're talking at least almost 10 years ago, quite some time ago. And then I've gone back into the document from time to time asking further questions and put a little more detail into it. And I anticipate I'll probably be going back in and asking some follow-up questions because as I change, so do my questions, you know, and so, so does my frame of reference. So it's kind of a living document, but it's interesting because when I channeled this information on the chakras, it was kind of beyond my ken. Do you know what I mean? It was beyond my knowing. The concepts that were coming through seemed really kind of crazy to me. And of course now, 10 years later or whatever it is, I, they're not as crazy to me because <laughs> I've been kind of working in the energy for, for quite some time. But back then, they really were. And it took me a few years, two or three years, to kind of compile it all in one place and make it cohesive or cogent. And so I'm going to start by saying that I'm just going to assume that most of you have a working understanding of what the chakras are. You know, there's a lot of resources out there. Of course, we have Amber Poole, who is the chakra diva. She's here in the lab, and she teaches about chakras and crystals all the time. And I'm anticipating that you understand that the chakras themselves, in terms of conventional or traditional teaching, are energetic centers or energetic areas around the body, upon the body, within our field as well, above us, kind of below us. We've got these energy centers that are connected to us intimately, and they serve a variety of purposes. They often correlate very intimately with what's going on in the physical body. So if you've got something that's a little wonky or misaligned in the energies, then that's going to show up on some level and at some time in the physical body and vice versa. If you have a physical ailment or a physical problem, that's going to be reflected in the energy as well. Because of course, we're synergetic humans, we're triune humans, which is what I like to say, trinity humans. Body, mind, and spirit, these three aspects make up the whole and the energy of it all, the chakra system of it all, connects to all aspects, all signals, all subsignals, and so on. So I know I'm speaking in the language of my students in the intensive because we've covered a lot of this, but for some of you, you might not be as familiar. Just know that the chakras, this is an ancient system that's been, along, uh, been around for millennia. You can do your own research on traditional values and concepts around that system. This is not at all about that. So let's just get that right out of the way. What the guides talked to me about was completely different from my understanding of what the chakra system was. And so probably for some of you, it's going to be completely different. They connected it to things like gateways, stargates, portals. They connected it to things like sacred geometry, ascended masters, and angels. They also connected it to resonances and frequencies. And that's not necessarily new. The chakras have their own frequencies and chords and stuff. But a lot of interesting information and so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to just kind of get through a chunk of it and I'm going to come back probably next week and I'll continue where I left off but I just want to give you the working foundation of what my guides call the portal system not the chakra system but the portal system and they explain in this document that the way they actually see us when they view us is this living energy and they can see us based on our portals, and we attract guides based on our portals, the portals that we align with, the portals that are open, and so on and so forth. They see us according to the energy, not necessarily our physical form. So let me bring up the document. I'm going to be reading a bunch of it, and then I'm going to be expounding upon it where I can. I don't like to change too much of it because it was channeled, and I don't want to go in there and edit a whole bunch of stuff. But... Essentially what happened was I was given these concepts and then I just began asking questions around it. So the way we'll do it is I'll read you the question that I asked my guides and then I'll read you the guide's answer and we'll go from there. All right? Hi, Joanne. Hi, Brian. Hi, 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 everybody. Welcome. Super happy that you're here. If we have time afterwards, we can do some questions around the work and we can perhaps even do some 
readings if we're all game and we all want to do that. Okay, the first two chapters I talk about myself as little as possible because it's truly not about me at all. And I, as I said before, when it came through, I was kind of gobsmacked. Like, <laughs> what? So it's not about me. And then there's a chapter about the guides, who they actually are, what kind of beings they are. But I'm not going to go into that. And then there's a chapter about chakras, the traditional understanding. We're not going to go into that. I'm just going to assume that most of you kind of know what that is. We're going to go straight to chapter four, which is titled Chakras lock-in, and grids. You ready? Let's go. My question. Please explain chakras and the chakra system generally. Their answer. The chakras are part of an energetic system which operates in conjunction with the physical and mental systems and which connects to various systems or grids beyond our human body or the human body. We'll refer to the chakras themselves as portals, for this is exactly what they are. Portals are gateways between dimensions and places and spaces, or, if you will, wormholes. The human portals keep the human connected to absolutely everything. The portals receive external energies and help to assimilate them into the human systems. The portals transmit internal or individual energies or your specific personal energies to the energetic systems beyond. Most importantly, the portals interrelate with one another within the human energetic system to create a complete synergistic or synergetic state, a state that we will call lock-in. So what they're saying is that we have many portals. These portals act as gateways. Portals are chakras, but chakras or portals also interrelate. And when they interrelate or are harmonized, a grid happens around the human being. And, and it appears kind of like this pulsating, beautiful sphere of light. And this is what they call, the guides call lock-in. Like you're locked in, you're locked and loaded, everything's harmonized, you're ready to go. My next question. And you can kind of see where I was in my journey at the time. <laughs> okay, please elaborate on the state of lock-in and what part lock-in plays in ascension. Their answer, lock-in occurs when all portals are open, strong, and active, creating synergy within all the bodily systems. Because the energy, right, when the energy is out of balance, it shows up in the physical, and then it shows up in the mind, and it shows up in the spiritual. What they're saying is that this beautiful pulsating sphere, this healthy sphere or portal is created when all of the portals are harmonized and interacting with the mind, body, and spirit. So there's a whole synergetic system that's taking place. When the portals are activated, open, and all bodily systems, mind, body, spirit, interrelate synergistically, an additional energetic grid is created around the individual, which is this sphere that I was just talking to you about, as well as an opening of sorts. So when everything's harmonized, we've got the grid, but we also have an opening that takes place, or a new capacity for receptivity and also for transmission. Also, they say, a new launching point happens. The individual's grid then expresses outward and locks in to the next or to the most proximate external energetic grid. So first we have harmonization. All of the chakras are open, they're strong, they're running. They're syncing up with the mind, body, spirit and all of the sub-signals that exist within each aspect. And now we have this grid that happens as a result of that harmonization. It's not just something happening in an insulated fashion, however, happening to us. No. When lock-in occurs, when that kind of harmonization and synchronization occurs, we begin to express outwards, and we begin to connect up with grids, spaces, and places beyond us. And the guides say, or call it, the, most proc the next most proximate external grid. I ask from here, the grid created upon lock-in sounds a bit like the concept of the Merkaba. Is this correct? They answer, yes, the Merkaba is another name for the grid created via lock-in. However, 
Presently, some of the information disseminated surrounding the activation of the Merkaba is either needless, inaccurate, or obsolete. The individual lock-in grid is far more accessible and utilizable than is currently believed and does not require an intricate and convoluted process of activation. I'm not sure how many of you understand or know about what the Merkaba is, or perhaps you've learned the Flower of Life teachings as taught by Junvalo Melchizedek, for which I have a bunch of respect, mad respect for Junvalo and that entire system. But what the guides are saying is that that's pretty convoluted. You know, I think if I recall correctly, you have to have a certain amount of breaths. You have to get this part of the mer Merkaba going this way and this part of the Merkaba going that way. And like this whole thing that can be kind of overwhelming. And a lot of people just say, oh, forget it. I'm never going to get that. What the guides are saying is that lock-in, creating this grid that comes from the harmonization is a lot easier than what's currently being taught. Next, I ask. You mentioned external energetic grids beyond our own personal grid. Tell me more. To which they answer, just as your portals and your systems are connected and when activated create this personal grid or field, so too are the systems beyond. For example, the star systems, the universal systems respectively. They're separate from each other yet they are connected. When the energies within a specific system synergize, it too creates an encompassing energetic grid, and this grid locks into additional external grids through which it gives and receives energy. And so what the guides are saying here is that just as we have all these aspects within the, the whole of who we are, and we can be harmonized and we create a grid, so too do certain systems, universal systems, dimensional systems, star systems, constellations, have their various aspects, yet when in harmony, they have a grid as well. And as we express out from our grid, we can lock into that grid. So if you're interested in the Pleiades, if I may just jump ahead for a moment, some of us are super interested, aren't we, in the Pleiades or with Arcturus? Arcturus has a grid around it that encapsulates or encompasses all of the aspects of and all the energy of Arcturus and the Arcturians. And we can actually lock into the grid of Arcturus if we know how to do that and if we understand how all of that works. They go on to say each grid carries within it its own unique form of energy, Pleiadian energy, human energy, animal energy, Arcturian energy. Their own form of energy information and specifically their own vibration. External energetic grids should be regarded as a landscape or a type of topography. This landscape is yours to travel and it always has been and contains within it an intuitive map for the purpose of your personal ascension. I ask from there, well how does one travel then and or how do we access those external grids? They answer, after lock-in is achieved, lock-in again is the state of harmonization, body, mind, and spirit with the portals. After lock-in is achieved, which again solely concerns activation of the individual's personal energies, these activated energies in the form of the personal grid then begin to express outwardly as one energy and begin and begins to connect to the various grids beyond. These external connection points are to be considered additional lock-in experiences and are typically encountered in a successive or organized progression, meaning we lock into the first one that we're most proximate to, and this lock-in, this harmonization with this grid allows us to then lock into the one after that. It's kind of like this incremental lock-in that takes place or access for us. Some beings, they say, upon achieving a certain level of awareness or ascension or shift in their consciousness, and upon activating a certain quality within their personal grid, may jump grids or lock-in points, meaning they will not have to incrementally ascend or incrementally access the grids based on proximity. And we'll talk about the grids and which ones are closest to us and how to access them, but what they're saying here is that you get to the point in your own personal ascension process, your own enlightenment, where you don't have to worry about proximity. You can jump 
from your personal grid and you can access a grid far, far, far away, if you will. It's not about space or direction because that's a 3D construct, but you can access all of these different points by jumping if you have that level of enlightenment. They continue to say, each external lock-in point, that is, the entrance to the external grids, they have a lot that we have, we express out, so it's almost as if we have a key, and we can connect with that grid which has the key hole, okay? Each external lock-in point, which is the key hole, which is the entrance to the external grid, allows the individual, which is you, to exchange energy with the grid or energetic system that you encounter. Most importantly, it allows the individual, you, to receive the specific quality of energy associated with the grid into which you have locked. So, meaning, if we lock into the angelic grid, and there is an angelic grid, we can transmit, send information to, but it also, that condition of lock-in or connection allows the angelic grid to transmit to us and we can receive the nature of that information and the nature of that energy as well. Grid system energies are typically far more advanced or elevated than the basic human energies. As one ascends, as one shifts, locking in with the various grids will become increasingly more important. As the consciousness expands, as you begin to understand more, as you connect with your higher self, with source energy, locking into these sources, these divine resources, becomes more important, and it also becomes easier as well. Again, we say typically, as it's not always the case, there are human beings on the planet at this time, they say, carrying and sustaining elevated energies that negate the need for incremental ascension, meaning they're already there. They don't have to do it step by step by step. They can just be where they want to go. How are you guys doing? Is this confusing for everybody? Hi, Rebecca. Hearts, if it's, if it's okay, if you're following along, I realize that it's kind of a bit much, but okay. I always like to teach in deference to the new folks, people who are new to spirituality. This is the kind of content that might be like, what is she talking about? And I get it. That's okay. Um, I think it's enough actually to just be in the presence of it and the energy of it. Even if you don't consciously understand or can't follow or this sounds crazy, being in the energy of it allows it to embed and to become assimilated or integrated. So don't worry about not necessarily understanding everything. But I know there's a lot of you out there going, I totally get this. I totally understand what you're talking about. All right, my next question. Can you please detail the external grids in terms of their order of increment or their order of progression? Remember, we lock into one that gives us access to the next, which gives us access. So how does that work? They answer yes. Please note, however, that this explanation concerns being on your planet within your dimension and your density. Grids vary greatly depending on the origin of the particular being interacting with them or the orientation of that being. Also, the grids are accessed in a sustained and enriching fashion only after the personal grid is achieved. In other words, which, which they do say, people can sometimes sporadically access different grids. I'm accessing the angelic grid. I'm accessing the David or the fairy grid, or I'm accessing the planetary grid. I'm accessing fourth dimension. They can do that sporadically because they happen to go in and out of alignment or a state of lock-in. But what they're saying is that to get the most out of it, to really grow from it and to ascend, you have to reach that harmonization first. You have to reach lock-in and then, and then access these grids in a sustained fashion from there. Okay, consider the personal grid to be the key and the external grid's lock-in point to be the keyhole. The first grid immediately available after the creation of the personal grid is the consciousness grid. The consciousness grid is the energetic grid formed specifically by the consciousness of all living humans on your planet, as well as some residual consciousnesses 
from individuals who have lived before Buddhic, Christ consciousness, so on and so forth. Particularly those more ascended humans or avatars, as well as some of the archetypal personalities of importance. This consciousness grid includes only human consciousness, which is to say not the consciousness of animal, plant, mineral, etc. The consciousness grid relates most closely to the first portal. We would call that the root chakra, located right beneath your belly button. The next available grid is the planetary grid. This grid takes into account the consciousness of all beings on and in the earth at all times, as well as the individual energies of the earth itself. Dimensionally speaking, you're talking about 1D, 2D, and 3D. 3D encompasses the energies of 1D and 2D, but it's mostly about human consciousness, although the others are present. And so the planetary grid can be likened to 1D, 2D, and 3D. The earth, the minerals, the soil, the plants, the trees, the animals, the humans, and so on and so forth. The planetary grid relates most closely to the second portal. Now, we've been talking about grids as being something external to us. What they're saying here is that the planetary, the planetary grid exists, but the connection point is within. And the connection point for the planetary grid, for the consciousness of Gaia, the consciousness of animal, the consciousness of trees, is within the second, which is the sacral chakra. The next available grid is the Devic grid. This energetic system concerns the etheric beings, the light beings, within your dimension known as the fairy, the sprite, the nature spirit, and the deva. This grid naturally interacts and exchanges with the planetary and consciousness grids at all times and relates most closely with the third portal, which is your solar plexus portal. And I'll just say that these etheric beings, the fairy, the nature elementals, the gnomes, spirits of the trees, the devic, interact all the time seamlessly, are woven into the fabric of the planetary grid, of the consciousness grid. They're just as present, but they're their own, it's their own energy, it's their own vibration. The next available grid is called the astral grid. This grid contains the energy of all the dimensions within your reality, within our universe, as well as all the beings that exist therein. The astral grid relates most closely to the fourth, which is, of course, the heart chakra, the fourth portal. And so de depending on what universal architecture paradigm you presently subscribe to, this can be your dimensions of light which would be dimensions 1 through 12 or 1 through 13. This can be what Drunvalo Melchizedek talks about, dimensions 1 through 144. Nobody knows how many dimensions there actually are. We can only have theories and speculation around this. But the energy of all the beings within all the dimensions, however many there are, as well as the levels that exist within the dimensions, because there are dimensions in dimensions, all of that energy and all of those beings are contained in what they're calling the astral grid. So if you want to jump into, for example, 5D, which is where Christ consciousness and Buddhic consciousness dwells, then you want to access the astral grid. And you do that by working with the fourth portal. So everybody kind of understanding what I'm talking about here. We'll pause here to say that by virtue of accessing the planetary grid, which is the second, which is the sacral grid, just by virtue of accessing the planetary grid, which takes into account the consciousness of all beings on and in the earth, an individual also necessarily interacts with the consciousness, Davic, and astral grids. All four of these grids that we just talked about are closely related to and locked into one another. To access one means you have access or access points 
to all four, although the quality of the energy varies from grid to grid. And as you start working with divine energy and higher dimensional energy, and you start tripping the light fantastic, right, and moving from grid to grid, you'll know, even though you have access to all four, simply by accessing one, you'll begin to feel the subtle difference of energy between the Davic and the astral and the consciousness and so on and so forth. But this is good because by simply accessing the one, you have access to all four. The next available grid, they say, is the powers grid. This grid contains the energies of all beings currently assigned to assist your planet and its occupants at this time. This includes the consciousness of spirit guides, shining ones, elevated interdimensionals, all classes of angels and ascended masters. Our community of beings also con conducts its work within the powers grid. So the guides are telling me here, this is where we orient from. We orient from the powers grid. Really what they do is they broadcast from, they broadcast from the powers grid, this, this specific vibration. And I'm picking up the broadcast here in my personal grid, which is locked in. The David grid is closely associated with the powers grid because those of the Davic world are also here for the primary purpose of assisting Earth. Therefore, to access the Davic grid, if you want to work with the fairies and the nature elements and elementals, puts you into proximity to the powers grid. means gets you close to the angels, gets you close to the spirit guides, get you, gets you close to these elevated or enlightened interdimensionals. The powers grid relates most closely with the fifth portal, which is, of course, our throat chakra. The next available grid is the sun grid, the sun grid. This grid includes all energies and consciousnesses found within your specific solar system. And when I heard that, I was like, there's just us right here on this big blue marble. I mean, what are you talking about? But that's not the case at all. And they go on to say to include not only the consciousness of the sun, the planets, the moons, the asteroids and the like, but also the beings living upon and within them. The sun grid relates most closely to the sixth portal, which is your third eye chakra. Now let me just stop here for a second. And I believe Trisha just taught on this or she just had a show about the consciousness of the sun. It has a specific energy and it is an aware being. The consciousness of the moon, while different though related, has its own energy, has its own vibration, and is a thinking, sentient being. Truly, all the planets, planetary bodies, things that exist, moons, rings that exist within our solar system have a specific energy, and this energy has its own awareness. And indeed, there are beings that exist on different planets here in the solar system that we simply, they don't relate to us in the physical 3D necessarily. They're in the 3D, but they're not, they're not dense like we are. They are of a different vibration. So we can't see them, but they exist. There's huge bodies of work out of the 50s and the 60s about beings from Venus, beings from Mars. And of course, that was pop culture back then, right? War of the Worlds. And that's kind of the way humanity was thinking. But there's a lot of information about etheric light beings, beings of a different vibration who are existing in this solar system, but in a way that we can't perceive because of our, our vibration. And there have been civilizations here on Earth, for that matter, who have shifted right out of their physicality. Shifted, right? The Anasazi would be one group that was here one day, and the next, they were not. Why? You can see where they lived. You can see their villages. You can see their implements. You can see their tools. Where'd they, where'd they go? And some would say that they achieved a state of vibration, or really a state of consciousness. They shifted to such a degree. They're still here. They're still on Earth, but they are in a new Earth. This is kind of the direction we're trying to head. If you subscribe to Ascension and Shift mythology and lore, we're heading in the direction of a more subtle and higher energy. Doesn't, make, doesn't take us off planet, though. We're still on planet. 
They're just existing at a different frequency. Same with beings associated with different planets. Just because we can't see them doesn't mean they do not exist. The next available grid, they say, is the star grid. And it's attached to your various known and unknown astronomical star and constellation systems. For example, while there is a specific grid associated with Orion and another grid associated with Sirius, these grids also lock into one another, forming the larger encompassing star grid. So accessing the star grid in general allows you to experience and interact with the individual grids within it. Pleiades, Arcturus, Orion, Sirius, Draco, all of that is encompassed in the star grid. The star grid most closely relates to the seventh portal. And isn't that interesting? If any of you have ever listened to my teaching on the three main portals, you know that the interdimensional guides, the interdimensional friends, those interdimensional beings that are attracted to us because we're working with specific spiritual technology or scientific technology, they come through this crown. They access us through this seventh portal. And this is why. The next available grid, they say, is called the home grid. And for your purposes, they tell us, the home grid should be considered your known universe. Your known universe. Within the home grid are contained all grids. All grids. And the home grid relates most closely with the eighth portal, which is anywhere from six inches to two feet above your head, sometimes higher, sometimes bigger than that. They go on to say that beyond the home grid, which again contains this universe, there are multiverses, of course, we know this. It's not just us. There are many iterations, universally speaking, but within this house, with these dimensions, with these star systems, with this solar system, we call it the home grid. But there are many, many other home grids outside of our own. So here they're getting us in touch with the reality that it's not just us. There's more, and where there is more, there are other grids. There are other access points. There are other lock-in points. And it's about to get super interesting. What time is it? You know, I could talk about this forever. Okay, we'll keep going. Is that okay? Hi, Jess. I see Jess Viscomi. Hello, darling. I told them all about the lovely necklace and also how to get in touch with you. But you see Jess's name? She's the one who crafted this beautiful pendant that I have given two or three classes with now and talked to a lot. I talked to her. She's so cute. I can't stand it. We talk. But I love this. It's so gorgeous. And if you're interested in a custom piece, I would recommend you reach out to Jess for sure. Back to the home grid. When one masters ascension to the point of accessing the home grid, meaning accessing all the grids within the home grid, one then gains access to most other universal or dimensional grids, meaning all the stuff outside of our universe. At this point, further organized progression or incremental ascension grid by grid by grid may or may not be necessary. To reach the utmost level within your grid system, that is within the home grid, essentially gains you access into most other houses or universes. This would be considered a type of jumping. Jumping is discussed further on in this particular channeled work. I then ask, okay, does an individual have to experience lock-in and the creation of the personal grid to access and experience any or all of the external grids? Like, do I have to be in complete harmony, oming for nine hours a day, super high vibe in order to access these external grids, to which they say, to generally experience the external grids? No. Understand that all the energies of creation move and interact with all beings on all levels at all times. They're saying it's always there. And then really, it's, it's not about distance. It's about us moving through the energy of that and that moving through the energy of us. In this way, you are endlessly surrounded at all times and you're affected by these energies, though you're perhaps not doing so consciously or intentionally. In other words, you don't know when you're in the powers grid. You don't know when you're flowing through the fairy grid. Still, 
They exist and they are indeed available whether you have created your personal grid or not. However, to access and to consciously, in an aware way, experience within these external grids, yes, the creation of the personal grid is necessary. This typically occurs in one of three ways. First, a person may experience what is called a sporadic personal grid. This occurs when the personal grid is created due to a series of circumstances and a combination of energies not intended by the individual. This creation of the sporadic personal grid presents to be in the form of epiphanies, sudden epiphanies, revelations, sudden awareness, sudden abilities, sudden understanding. Moments of supreme clarity when you find yourself suddenly feeling connected to everything and in possession of limitless knowledge and insight. Pause here. There's a book called Super Consciousness written by Colin Wilson. I really should have put that on the book list. Colin Wilson, whom I love, may he rest in peace, wrote so many books that people like you and me absolutely love. Anyway, how many of you by a show of thumbs up or hearts experienced, at least as children, because this is when it happened the most, moments that kind of came out of the blue where you suddenly felt so happy, so loved, so connected to all things, just so good, like a surge of endorphins and all these good hormones flooded your body, your mind, and your spirit. Colin Wilson calls that the peak experience. And for most of his life, he studied it. He's like, why does that happen? What it, what's happening right before that happens? How can I have that more? And he believed that was a state of super consciousness. And for whatever reason, most of us slip in and out of that unintentionally. And that's what they're talking about. They're saying from time to time, we create this sphere that allows us to lock in based on the energies available to us, based on whatever we're doing, how we're vibrating, what we have access to, and sometimes the chemicals that are flooding our body. And so we find ourselves in these spaces of accessing, able to perceive in expanded ways. They say you may achieve momentary contact, but you cannot intelligently direct that contact. You just know, oh, something's happening here. All of a sudden, I'm seeing a spirit, or all of a sudden, I'm hearing something, or I'm feeling something, but you're not directing it. You're not in charge of this. This can also be likened to Kundalini syndrome. People who are shifting, people who are changing, people who are meditating, they are shifting around the energies that we're talking about here. And every once in a while, even though they don't intend it, they are blasting open their psychic receivers and these points of connection. And all of a sudden, they have 20 dead people in their bedroom. That's a true story of one of my good friends. Went to bed, not a medium, woke up 20 dead people in her room, had to be committed in the psych ward and medicated because she did not know what was happening to her. But she just all of a sudden shifted out of her regular frequency and into a new one. And we've had... People like Father Malachi Martin, although he was pretty heavily into seeing demons all the time. I'm not into that. But he would go into psych wards and he'd say, all these people are, this is a spiritual thing that's happening. This is not a problem in the brain. It's, it's, it's an issue with energy. It's an issue that's spiritual. And so people can experience opening up all of a sudden and not be prepared for it. They can connect into all these different grids and not be prepared for it. It's called kundalini psychosis and also kundalini syndrome. And some of us just think it's super consciousness. All of a sudden, whew, I, I have, I'm connected to everything. Alternatively, they say, there is the creation of the sustained personal grid, which is a state that everyone should strive for. The sustained personal grid occurs when an individual intentionally prolongs the energy of the personal grid. In other words, works to get there, works is a hard energy, but intentionally gets there and then strives to sustain the energy of that, the harmonization of all the systems. The sustained personal grid occurs when an individual intentionally prolongs the energy of the personal grid either by becoming aware in the midst of a sporadic event or by engaging in disciplines and practices that cultivate and bring about lock-in and personal grid creation, which is interesting because for some of us who find ourselves periodically opening up, they're implying that if you become aware in that state 
and become aware and familiar with the energy that you're moving in, you can actually then begin to commandeer it and intentionally prolong the state of lock-in or the, the personal grid. The sustained personal grid allows the individual to direct his or her energies and consciously interact with the grids beyond. The last is the default personal grid. This involves the presence of the personal grid on a permanent basis, meaning that's your default state. That's how you're walking around the planet in this big sphere of electrified, undulating, totally connected energy. And this state, this permanent state, typically spans the course of an individual's entire lifetime. The default personal grid state is rare, though this too is beginning to change as the shift progresses. Curious, I asked, who in our history has been able to experience a sustained personal grid? Which is different than the default grid, by the way. So I'm just asking, who is able to sustain that? To which they answered, most assuredly, Ascended Master Jesus, Ascended Master Buddha. Edgar Cayce also sustained and managed his personal grid with great benefit. Pythagoras, Teresa of Avila, Paramahansa Yogananda, Joan of Arc, Sai Baba of Shirdi, Francis of Assisi, Akhenaten, Sri Yukteswar. There have been many, they say. You have rightly considered them to be saints or avatars. Having said this, many others have achieved a sustained personal good for long periods of time, people you would consider normal or average. The sustained personal grid is becoming far more achievable now due to your present time in the shift, meaning really due to our frequency and how it is changing. It is becoming far more possible to walk around with a harmonized personal grid. I then asked, who in our history experienced the default personal grid, meaning all the time walking around in this state of connection? Of those mentioned above, only Jesus and Buddha lived their entire lives in the default state of lock-in, which is interesting to me because, of course, Buddha had his moments of secular life, of course, and Jesus, well, we don't know what he did from 13 to 30, but I mean, so it's, it, that was interesting to me. They, they go on to say, they were in fact more spirit than physical, though they were rarely perceived by others as such. Both were able to reveal themselves in the physical and be interpreted or perceived by the physical while at the same time existing for the most part outside of the earthly plane, organizing and dispensing from higher dimensions. In other words, they were technically out of body all the time, existing within the energetic grids and higher dimensions, yet interacting with and being perceived by the physical, almost like Jesus was the Mario and Buddha was the Luigi and their player and their control system was in the fifth dimension, you know, which is where con the Christ consciousness is and Buddhic energy or orients from. What they're saying is so cool that even though they had their physical lives, they were pretty much always out of body. They were animated and doing things and functioning in a physical and a human way, but they were in the fifth dimension. I say, with a little bit of disappointment at this point, <laughs> it seems like quite a feat, if not simply impossible, for a human being to achieve a default personal grid like Jesus and Buddha did. Is it really attainable? And they answer, this is the point of the entire message. Yes, it is attainable. And in fact, it will happen more and more as ascension progresses, whether a person is ready for it or not. Even those who are unprepared and who lack knowledge will experience events of pronounced and prolonged personal grid activation. When the lock-in happens, that means we are expressing out locking in. Even if you lack knowledge, even if you're not looking for it, this can still happen. This is going to cause confusion, chaos, and even fear. How many of you out there now are experiencing evidences, signs and wonders, if you will, and there's some fear around, like, why is this happening? What does this all mean? What's this all about, Alfie? 
This is what they're talking about. People will experience confusion, chaos, and even fear. It'll seem like a frightful thing because the infrastructure of understanding isn't there, the scaffolding that you need in order to understand why it's happening. However, those who are prepared and who have immersed themselves in the elevated energies will recognize the activation when it happens and they'll be able to sustain it for longer and longer periods of time. The potential for the sustained and also the default grid is easier now to obtain than ever before. Simply put, it's now possible for the average individual to experience grid activation for prolonged periods of time without at any point calling in or cultivating that state. However, the more someone nurtures the activations and seeks them out, the more they will occur and the longer they will last, making the default personal grid entirely possible. This is the byproduct of the shifting energies. This is the good news. So do you understand what they're saying there? They're saying you don't even have to be spiritual to experience grid activation. That's just, grid activation sounds so technical, which you don't have to be spiritual. You don't have to be knowledgeable in metaphysics to all of a sudden have access to energies that are completely foreign to you and are powerful and are divine. And that's not necessarily because of you. It's because of what's happening in terms of the energy on the planet. Yea, I say unto you, in, in terms of the energy in our galaxy, in the universe, everything is shifting. All beings on all in all dimensions are shifting right along with us. Why do you think these ETs are so interested in us figuring this out for ourselves? Why do you think the Pleiadians are visiting Barbara Marciniak? Why do you think Edgar Cayce called the Arcturians the most advanced species or civilization in our galaxy? They are here with us and they are shifting too. And they are trying to give us the spiritual technology, which orients in love always. They're trying to give us the spiritual technology to help us to shift because we, to some degree, are like anvils around their neck a little bit. or We're like anchors that keep the whole organism of the universe and the dimensional structure from shifting and raising. That's why they're helping us. And that's why more and more of us are opening because the energies are changing. They're opening us up whether we want to or not. I ask then, you see how much more we have before the next chapter? Not much, just a couple more questions. I ask then, can we activate our personal grid by simply imagining and focusing on it. This is also called consciousness activation. When you put all of your attention, all of your focus, all of your awareness and intention into something, whether that's a thought, whether that's a part of your body, whether it's a space outside of you, when you focus on it intentionally and with intent, it activates that which you focus on. So I'm asking, can we activate these grids by focusing on them in this manner? And they say, usually there's more to it than that. Ding dong, joking. Other practices and behaviors are typically required to bring about the activation of the personal grid. We say typically because again, sometimes activation will occur automatically, such as the phenomenon of Shaktipat, which is also becoming more and more commonplace on the planet at this time. We talk about Shaktipat more later in this particular channeled work for your purposes. Shaktipat is the transmission of enlightenment, usually associated with yogis, gurus, who touch um, an acolyte or a disciple and transmit instantaneously enlightenment to them or instantaneously open their consciousness in a moment. That's called Shaktipat. Also, the very presence and the magnitude of the shifting energies around you may cause periodic activation of the personal grid. We say it's better to cultivate, to work with the personal grid through disciplines, practices, and working with energy than to experience it unprepared. Experiencing it unprepared is typically not conducive to sustained or default states, and it's also typically not fun. Ask, for example, Lauren Antwofermo. She's talked about this a few times in some of her broadcasts. She was opened up prematurely, just like my friend who went to bed not a medium, woke up a medium, prematurely, wasn't prepared for it, and as a result, struggled mightily 
with what was going on with her. She came through it, of course, but it's better to nurture it, finesse it, work with it intentionally through practices, understanding, knowledge, discipline, fellowship, all of that, than to receive it unprepared. And some of us, many of us, are going to receive it unprepared because it's just going to be time to go. It's time to shift. You're, either with, you know, you're going to have to come with us. You can be at the very back if you want to, but the, the line is still moving. We're still marching on. Last question. What are some behaviors that will aid in the creation of our personal grid? How do we harmonize? How do we open and activate all of these portals, such as they call them, which interrelate with the body, mind, and spirit in all aspects and systems within each of these aspects, which make us the Trinity human? So how do we do that? They say visualizations, specific meditations, intentional interactions with nature, which I've talked about a lot. Just being in nature aligns you very quickly to a high vibration. Prayer, a willful setting of intentions through the application of specific resonances, frequencies, tones, which correlate with the portals themselves. Study and practice to include studies overseen by an enlightened teacher through the combination of portal related resonances and later in this channeled work they talk about the resonances that open up these stargates. So doing stuff like that through the pure and the focused alignment of the physical body, meaning the wellness of the body, the state of detoxification within the body. Not everybody can be well, of course. Some of us have illnesses and some of us have maladies, but to the best of our ability, being as fine-tuned as possible so as to act like an instrument that receives and conducts and then helps the grid to lock in. Through the use of certain materials, such as gemstones and crystals, oils and essences, talismans, power objects, through the utilization of gateway symbology, which we'll talk about, the symbols for each portal, activating those, through the energetic insertion of frequencies and vibration, and these are just a few. Thus ends that chapter, chapter four, in which we talked about the grids, what they were, we talked about our personal grid, what that was, and we ended with some of the things that we can do, which we kind of already know. These are spiritual practices that we do, but making sure to do them. And when we learn later on, like what the resonances are, what the symbols are, what the different portals are actually connected to, then we can start to intelligently work with the activation and make those connections. The next chapter deals with chakra imbalance, because as the energies fluctuate, and they are, we are going to feel that in the physical systems. We're going to feel that in the mind systems, in the emotional systems, in the spiritual systems, and we're going to feel that in the portal system. And so some of us are very well intentioned. Some of us conduct our disciplines and we pray and meditate and get out and we do all those things, but we still experience imbalance within the portal system or the chakra system. And so what can we do about that and how does it show up? That's the next, cha next chapter, which I will save for the next time, okay? Because it's, it's a lot of information.